Hi, everyone, and welcome to 40 Minutes of Faith. My name is Barbara Cox, and I host this weekly podcast to explore God's Word and our relationship with God. Today's guest is Joanne Hines, and we'll be talking about and listening to music today. I met Joanne when I was a member of the Praise Band at Christ the King Lutheran Church in Holliston, Massachusetts. Joanne was baptized, confirmed, and married in the congregational tradition. She grew up in Holliston, lived in Pennsylvania for a few years, Saugus, Massachusetts, and then New Hampshire, ending up back in Holliston. Joanne has worked in the field of music for 28 years, teaching, playing the piano at church for 14 years, and serving as music director for a children's theater for 20 years. She would love to write more music, especially for piano with other instruments. We'll get to hear some original music in a few minutes, too. Welcome, Joanne. How are things in Holliston these days? Good. Things are quiet, like they are most places right now. Sure. And it is starting to warm up, but Holliston's doing well. Great. I'm glad to hear that. Our Bible passage today is Psalm 150. The Psalms are right in the middle of your Bible if you want to follow along with us. Here are all six verses of Psalm 150 from the New International Version. Praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heavens. Praise him for his acts of power. Praise him for his surpassing greatness. Praise him with the sound of the trumpet. Praise him with the harp and lyre. Praise him with timbrel and dancing. Praise him with the strings and pipe. Praise him with the clash of cymbals. Praise him with resounding cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Joanne, it seems kind of obvious why you might have selected this psalm for us today, but I'd love to hear your thoughts about music in the Bible, especially here in this psalm. I like this psalm because they actually talk about different instruments as opposed to just the voice as an instrument. And it talks about trumpet and cymbals. I first learned about this when we did a celebration of our band leaders 25 years he started the band and pastor mark our pastor read this out loud and i thought oh this is my verse i love this that it spoke to instruments other than just the voice because you do hear a lot about raising your voice to the lord but there are other ways to raise your voice with musical instruments Thank you. And I have a question for you later about different types of musical instruments, but this really highlights the diverse ways of praising God and even dancing is in there, which for a lot of people is part of music. Not always in church, though. (laughs) How did you get started with church music, Joanne? I actually got started at Christ the King. In the Congregational Church, I had volunteered. When they needed a sub, I would volunteer to play. But really, the pastor that was at Christ the King at the time ran into me at the gas station. Excellent. Yeah. And I hadn't seen him since I was a teenager. And I used to do things in the community. I would play at baccalaureate. And so that's kind of how he knew me and my parents who are now gone. And I ran into him and he said, Oh, I haven't seen you. What what are you doing? I said, well, you know, I'm playing the piano. I said, wait a minute. What? You're playing the piano. Wait a minute. You're playing the piano. (laughs) And what I didn't know was they needed a pianist for the praise band. And there you have your God moment in the gas station, folks. Yes. Yep. It was though something was speaking to me. And then when I went to the pastor and looked at the music, I thought, well, I don't know any of these songs. Right. I mean, I didn't know it. And there's no music. There's no just chords. No notation for third three quarters of the music. Yep. Yeah, just chord changes and lyrics. And and she said, It's okay. It's okay. You can learn by ear and figure it all out. And that was 14 years ago. So it sounds like you weren't one of the founding members of the band, but do you know how they got started? How did a Lutheran church in suburban Boston, Massachusetts, decide to start a praise band? Well, the pastor who had been there for 47 years, he went out to, I think, Arizona to actually go to one of the big churches there and see what a contemporary service was like. And he brought that back Mm -hmm. to Christ King 25, 26 years ago. And I'm sure there was a huge learning curve. And he brought back all this information and they just started ramping up and pulling songs and pulling things together and doing it that way. Neat. So it was sort of a visionary idea that might have been an experiment and ended up really taking off. 
yes. in a good way. Yeah. It did. Yes, you're right. Yeah. When you think of the band on an average Sunday, about how many players do you have and what's the most number of musicians and singers you've ever had standing together at the same time? Or what's the bare minimum number of folks for the band? Well, I would say the bare minimum would be the people who sing the lead. So generally we get around six people. We have violinists yep. and and Jim, who really is the leader of the band. He plays drum, bass, guitar when he needs to also. Mm -hmm. Then we have a guitarist and then we have a bass player and a flute player. So it's basically that core group. We could do it with three. Yes. And I think we have done it with three as long as we have one lead singer. Yep. And if that's not available, and this has happened when no one's available because they're volunteers and my sure. position is a staff position. I just play some contemporary songs that have notation that people can sing along with during the service if there's no one else available. Okay, great. And the most I think we've ever had is probably 11 because we have some teenagers that come in and out. Yeah, they come right. to college yeah. and stay yep. for uh, a month or so and, and work around their schedules. That's helpful in case anyone's wondering, what does it take that you can have your small core and then ebb and flow as people are available? And the congregation right. loves the music too. So this isn't a performance. You're not selling tickets. This is part of a worship service. So right. they, they right. understand if someone's out sick or on vacation, let's be grateful for what we have. Exactly. Yes. So I am hoping that we can play a little bit of music today for folks to demonstrate some concepts. And there's a bunch of stuff we're not going to be playing that we would really love to play because music is copyrighted and licensed and we want to honor that. So somebody might think, well, you probably won't get into trouble, but it doesn't matter. It's not the right thing to do. So there's 150 songs that we would love to play, but that we're not going to play today. Right, exactly. But we do have a few examples because there is a time after a certain number of years when music is in the public domain and then there's no risk of having any licensing infringement. And, and most congregations pay for certain licensure so that they can play music and have yes. that even electronically. But my first question was, when we're talking about different styles of music sort of within worship services is the concept of modernizing time signatures. And what that means is that a lot of music as it's written kind of has a steady beat and people know what to expect. It's a familiar song. And then we were talking about how do you kind of jazz things up? And one example recently has been the national anthem. And I actually don't have any problem with how it was modified a bit, or maybe liberties taken with it, people might say at the inauguration ceremony or even at the Super Bowl, I enjoyed that. But that's an example of how I know it made some people crazy because when you know the rhythm, it's supposed to be a certain way and then it's kind of loosened up a little bit. So mm. I was wondering if we could illustrate that with A Mighty Fortress is Our God, which is a classic Lutheran hymn with just a few measures of sort of the original, the way it was written really formally. And then we can talk for a minute about different ways of interpreting that. So actually with A Mighty Fortress, the big difference really is the tempo. Yeah. I have heard it played almost like a funeral march, like yes. a dirt, very yes. slowly which drives me crazy because, yep. you know, when we play in the contemporary service, it has a much more celebratory feel to it. Mm -hmm. So if I was in a congregation, I'll just play a couple of bars. So yep. it might start. That would be how an organist plays. Yes. If it was a band, there might be an introduction. The band leader would count it off. Yes. There might, so it, it perks it up a bit. So the tune is still there. The basics are still there. There might be a little bit of extra music. It sounded like you had a little extra bass notes going there and a little, I don't know if 
swing is the right word to use or just peppier or something like that. Yeah. And I should have said sooner that I absolutely love organ music. I'm a big fan of classical music. I'll just get goosebumps hearing a pipe organ thundering away. So I say that, that this doesn't seem like we're bashing. And I know you feel the right. same way, Joanne. We're not saying, oh, old music needs to get thrown out. But how does it feel when you sing it in a jazzier version? Yeah, I think it gives it a different feel. I yeah. think sometimes the slower version gives you an opportunity to really focus on the words. Yeah. The jazzier yeah. version gives you a sense of more of a celebration. And that's a word I had thought immediately when I first saw the contemporary service was that it feels like a celebration. You go out feeling like, yes, I'm ready for my week. I've celebrated my love of God. And, and not that I don't get that from the traditional service, yeah. but I really do get that from the contemporary service. And you add a little extra music in there that gives people time. Like in between verses, there's what you would call a turnaround, which yeah. will bring you back to the beginning. You have a little extra music. It gives people a sense that, okay, now we're ready to go back to the next verse. I mean, I, I love both ways. I love both ways that it's played. Exactly. And everyone really has their own individual response to how they feel refreshed and renewed. Some people feel tremendously comforted by the predictable liturgy in some faith traditions. And then other folks don't need the hymnal and the bulletin. And we're not talking about on-screen stuff today, but there's just a lot of different ways to praise God. And for me, that's the purpose of this conversation. Yes. Yeah, I agree. I know you had mentioned a few different instruments that are part of the praise band, and I'm wondering if you have any fun or unusual instruments that are part of the band just from time to time, maybe not necessarily every week. I know you mentioned really the drum, piano, guitar, and vocals are key, and you mentioned violin and flute also. Trumpet, I think, especially on Easter? Yes, yes. We did have a trumpet player for quite some time, and then he retired to the Cape, and he was wonderful. And we have... Yep a saxophone player for quite some time. Cool. But we also have a young teenage girl. Eric Ammon is one of the lead vocalists yep. and his daughter, ukulele. And she has a lovely voice and she plays a ukulele and yet it just adds a different texture. It's just yeah. one. Yeah. Oh, fun. Yeah, it is fun. What sorts of technical requirements could you just give a brief little overview that church say that's thinking about starting a praise band might want to be aware about besides just the physical instruments? Well, you need people who have strong voices, at least one or two. And you don't necessarily need to be able to read music, but it is helpful yeah. to, to, to be able to read music, especially if you're going to play some songs that have notation. At least the pianist, I read music and the violinist and the flute player, we all read music. It's not critical because you can learn a lot of these songs by ear. Some really talented singers, it comes from their soul. I started with music and it's in my soul, but it's even hard to explain. But I think when we're looking at melody, like you're saying, piano, flute, violin, if there's a melody that the congregation is singing along to, then that would help if it was more accurate. True. And a funny story is that one of my first years, I was, we have a couple hundred songs and we were just rifling yeah. through all of them. And at one point, I stopped playing, and I looked over at Jim, band leader. I said, wait a minute, wait a minute. You're playing this piece in four. And he said, yeah. I said, yeah, but it's written in three. Interesting. Uh, oh, he said, oh, can you play it four? Huh. I said, well, play it again for me. All right, we can play that in four. I'll play it in four. So my music's all marked. Change this to four. You know, add next to B. Yeah, because they learned it by ear, and I'm looking at the music thinking, Okay. Well, did it work or did it sound bad? Because uh, I'm oh, guessing it actually kind of worked. It worked. Yeah. All I needed <laughs> really funny. to do was to add an extra beat to every measure. <laughs> <laughs> so it no longer sounds like a waltz. It sounds exactly like four. Yeah. But actually, my brain was going, wait a minute, wait a minute. But it's right. and that's a great thing for a musician to be challenged like that, thinking, okay, how am I going to do this and keep up? Because they were the experts. They knew all of this music. They've been singing together for years. And I think sound equipment is a good thing. We have a new soundboard. And sometimes we have an electric guitarist. Yep. And then we have the violinist has a pickup that she hooks up and then mm -hmm. into the soundboard. So you can hear her. So that's a good thing to do. I think you could probably do it if, with acoustic instruments. Sure. Yeah. A drum, a piano, um, a violin, especially depending on the size of the church. Yep. Yeah. 
So we're not saying you need a whole bunch of money to spend on a whole bunch of fancy equipment, start with what you have. But if you're looking at how are we going to do this eventually, if there's a lot of people in the room, then some sound equipment would be helpful. Yes, exactly. Any other technical advice if someone is thinking about Mm -hmm. starting this up? Well, I think for a lot of people having the recorded music to listen to makes a big difference. I know for me, the first year I listened to everything. So if you have recorded music you can listen to and learn from that and practice at home Mm -hmm. Uh, that makes a big difference too and that's an easy thing especially now we have song select through ccli that's one of the licensing companies yep yes and i can hear a song on krishna radio and go on and get it through the licensing Mm. company i can get a lead sheet which is good for the violinist or the flute player and also charts, and then just also lyrics, which can be put into the bulletin. Oh, phenomenal. I yeah. just Googled it because that's all I needed. <laughs> and then I said, well, wait, there's three different versions. Which one, <laughs> which one are we doing? Right. Yes. Yeah. You have to decide what you need. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So that is... One thing that I noticed and that I really enjoyed, Joanne, is that prayer time during the service that we're talking about right now included very soft and gentle background music. And there may be folks out there that say, no, you can do your prayers in silence, which of course is absolutely true. Many traditional church services just have the prayers read and there's no music in the background. But I believe that some people find that to be really meditative and peaceful with the goal of it creating a a helpful environment. And I was so happy to learn that you write your own music. And sometimes if there was a particular piece of music being played during that church service, then during the prayer time, you would play your own version of that tune. And I was wondering if we could invite listeners to pray on their own for just about a minute while we listen to some music with no talking I've never done this before in a podcast episode, but just to kind of show an example of what kind of music might be played in the background during prayers. Now, during the church service, someone usually is talking, but just right now, we wouldn't talk for about 60 seconds. How does that sound, Joanne? That sounds fine. Would you like me to play something I have written? Absolutely. That would be fabulous. I trust your judgment in terms of what you would play during a church service during prayer time. Yeah. And we do have some that we cycle through. Mm -hmm. But also I have used some of my own music for all kinds of things during the service. So I'm more than happy to play. I have one called Places to Dream that I wrote right after my dad died. So I wrote a lot right after my dad died. And I have played this one at church. It was some time ago. You keep playing and then I'll say amen at some point. How's that sound? Sounds perfect. So we invite you to a time of prayer, personal prayer. Thank you so much, Joanne. I feel like music is a language and some people listen to it and and really treasure it. And maybe some people feel like they can speak that language or it goes deep into our bodies. I have this little plaque in my piano studio that says, God gave us music that we might pray without words. And especially for people who might know if you happen to be playing music, but nobody's singing, but you recognize the tune and you happen to know the words that go with it, you might be singing inside, even though you don't need Mm. words to pray like you yes. said. Yeah, that's true. Yep. Nice. Yeah. What sort of time investment are folks looking at, especially if they're learning new music? Well, 
our rehearsal time technically is Wednesday nights for about an hour and a half and then mm -hmm. Sunday morning before the rehearsal, yep. uh, before the service for about yep. an hour. And that will change depending on the music. So if we've been playing some of these songs for 15 years, there's not a lot of rehearsal time that we need yep. unless we want to mix things up. And that does happen. Sometimes we'll mix up, add an extra chorus or something like that. Yeah. Uh, but when we're learning new music, we would, we might, Wednesday night, we might run through the music that we have maybe not as familiar with and then focus on learning a new song. And we have a sound system. So we'll just pull it up on our phone. And if I've already downloaded the license, then we can play along with the CD. Uh -huh. Yeah. And then that takes a little more time because then yeah. it takes a number of weeks to kind of get the flow so that the vocalists know exactly where to sing and yes. find, add. And, and then the band leader will say, well, Joe, can you do this here or this here or this here? I said, yeah, okay, let's add. I'm writing stuff down and we're adding yep. things. And then they're talking about different uh, riffs. Mm -hmm. Our riffs and sometimes I'm trying to match a little bit of the guitar riffs and so it does take the, the new songs take a little longer sure yeah and then That's, once once you've rehearsed it enough that you know it you know Jim will just tap the drumsticks three times or four depending on the time signature and then it'll just get started right away because you've done it so many times that it feels comfortable and people know what to do right right and some of those songs are very comforting for the congregation they've heard them for years Yes. The, the new ones, it's important to play with the congregation, then invite them to sing along, particularly in the chorus, because the chorus, as you know, happens frequently throughout the mm -hmm. piece. Mm -hmm. And the, mm -hmm. the verses, the music's basically the same, but the words change, but the chorus pretty much stays the same. So you invite the congregation to sing along and then eventually you'll do it again in a few more weeks and then a few more weeks. And then they, the congregation gets to know the song because yes. when there's no written music, for them, for people to follow along. Not that everybody reads music, but you can see when the line goes up and the line yeah. goes down. It's it, it can be uncomfortable for some people, but once once they've heard it a number of times, then it's much easier. You know, I'm really glad you pointed out, Joanne, that contemporary music sounds all newfangled, but I mean, Michael W. Smith has had friends out for decades and that's a very special song to the band. And, yeah. and it really was always very special to the whole congregation in general. But one of the lead singers just had the voice of an angel. And it was devastating when she became sick and passed away. So contemporary music isn't all newfangled. Yes. And uh, one of one of our favorites, and I think it might be one of your favorites, Robin Mark. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he's been around for tw uh, 20 years, 25 years, tw maybe 20 years. I think he last toured in 2014, maybe, but he's he's written a vast amount of music. And the, his music is, I mean, right off the top of my head, his music is very comforting and tells a story. And it doesn't mm -hmm. have to be, like you said, brand new and edgy. It and some people love edgy. I had the chance in Germany to worship at a couple of different military chapel services, and there's still new music coming out every day. And some of it, I thought, I've never heard of this before. So there's even sort of different maybe areas or niches of quote contemporary music that for me it's contemporary, but it's 20 years old. So it's really yeah, people say, well, that's not contemporary. Well, it is to me. <laughs> right. Yeah, you're right. You're right. Yeah. There's a lot of new stuff. I have stuff that pops up on my Spotify list because I have a playlist of praise music. Yeah. And they will guess new things like the, mm -hmm. the group casting crowns. How about a favorite band story or memory, Joanne? One of mine is singing the fruit of the spirit with the children's choir, and we can't play it for everybody. And there are several versions out there, but go ahead and take a look in your own time at all the different versions of the fruit of the spirit. The kids choir never sang with the band before. And when I took over the kids choir, it, we get to sing with the band and watching the adults with the kids is yeah. just phenomenal because it seemed like the kids were left out of being able to sing along with the band. Mm -hmm. And I thought, we've got to get the kids, especially for the fruit song. And they catch on to the music quickly and they love it. One of my favorite memories is learning how powerful non-traditional music can be, even in very solemn times, because we've talked so far about how much of the music is cheerful or uplifting. And I always knew, say, on Good Friday, we would sing, Were You There When They Crucified My Lord? And that always brings tears to my eyes. But then when the band, with just a few instruments, maybe even just one or two in a voice, would sing a song called Above All, 
that also brings tears to my eyes. And I just love that song and I want to listen to it all the time. But it's not the traditional Good Friday hymn that you might think of, but it's still really incredibly powerful. It is. It's very powerful. That one and the version of Amazing Grace called Oh Amazing. Yeah. One of the lead vocalists sings that. He used to sing it just him and the guitar. Now I do a little bit of light backup. I play mm-hmm. a little light backup. It's basically just him. And it's, the melody's different, but the words are the same. Yeah. And it's just, it is powerful. It's, it's, a, it's a different way of looking at the same lyrics. And I think people have an opportunity to, to hear the lyrics again when it's a different melody. That's a really good point. I noticed that at Christmas and I love this, Joanne, and I hope there's not a lot of people that this just drives them crazy, but the Christmas carols were sung to alternate tunes and I loved it. Oh, so yeah. There's just so many different ways of doing things. Mm-hmm. So if anyone has a moment, look up above all, if you're not familiar with it. And of course, there's a bunch of different artists that sing it in different manners. But just to honor, there's tradition and there's new tradition and it can get all mixed up. And for some people, that's really wonderful. Yes. And there's our Good Friday service, which may not happen this year because of the pandemic. But right. uh, we have a mix of uh, hymns and then the band sings a few songs, too, yeah. which is a nice mix. So people hear the, the hymns they grew up with, yet they'll hear something a little more contemporary as well, mm-hmm. which is really nice. Now, one of the critiques that I've heard, and you may have heard this too, Joanne, is that some people feel that contemporary music has lyrics that are really oversimplified from hymns. And I have a proposed example to sort of demonstrate this, because like I said before, I like hymns. I have no problem with hymns. But with this particular one that I have in mind that sort of blends the two, The traditional hymn is called Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. The hymnal that I have has three verses. And like you said, you kind of go right from the first verse into the second verse and all the words are printed out, which also can sometimes be difficult for people who have issues with reading. And I have heard both sides of this oversimplification argument. I can see how somebody might say that, but I also feel you said a few minutes ago, sometimes it can be really powerful and meditative to have just fewer words along the same theme. And that's what happens in another version that's called Come Thou Fount, Come Thou King, where the traditional verses are there, but they're interspersed with a longer, I don't know if you would call it a chorus or a bridge, yeah. that yeah, just has sure. fewer words and a different pace. So I'm wondering, could we do the same thing like we did before, play however much you want of the original hymn, and then we can show people the chorus or bridge of how to combine these two concepts. Sure. So in Come Thou Found, Come Thou King, it's basically the same music that is in Come Thou Found of Every Blessing. But then the chorus music is totally different, which it's another way to make the whole song stand apart. So you want to play a little bit of Come Thou Found of Every Blessing? Yeah, just to remind anyone who's familiar with that tune. Okay. that would be the first couple of lines in the hymnal. Yeah. And that's how it starts with come thou found, come thou king. But when you get to the chorus, the music's totally different. It's So it's echoing, but the words are, come thou fount, come thou king, come thou precious prince of peace. And then those words are repeated a few times. Yes. So similar words, different music, but it stands apart from the beginning. And then there's some that don't really have any relationship to a previous hymn, but we just thought, hey, this might be one way to show a unique approach. Yes, yes. I did find an article that I'm going to post to the podcast website, which is 40minutesoffaith.com, an article written on a website called pastortheologians.com about this question of lyrics. 
because I, I wanted to really understand and not just brush it to the side and not just say, oh, hey, contemporary music is perfect. Don't criticize it. And this particular author was asking, is the song clearly written to God? Because there can be some songs that are, you're kind of not really sure. And how, how is the theology? So in the Lutheran faith, we believe that grace is a free gift. There's nothing we can do to earn it. God has given us this salvation. And so that's just kind of one example of we wouldn't want to sing a song necessarily that talks about how hard I'm working to get into heaven. Not that that's even a song that I can think of, but just as an example, are we worshiping God with this music, not promoting works righteousness? And it's okay to have testimonial songs as well. That was another point in this article that we talk about that God does good things in our lives and on earth. But again, we're wanting to honor God with that. Does that kind of make sense, Joanne? Yeah, it does. And there are some songs that, that uh, allude to God's love and grace, but don't come out and say it. And I'm thinking of Full Force Gale, yep. which is Van, Mor- Van Morrison, I think, wrote it. He went on to write Christian music. I mean, there are words in there, I'll find my sanctuary in the Lord, but this, the, the message is more of a broad message. It's about the love of God. In that way, I can see why people might not think it's appropriate or it doesn't match the lesson. Mm -hmm. But I think a lot of the contemporary music will fit with almost any lesson. Mm -hmm. Much of it, I think, does. Do you have any favorite songs that you want to mention, even if we don't play them? I think one of my favorite songs is Revival. Mm -hmm. I think that's another Robin Mark song because it tells a story. Yes. And then at the end, and this is a complaint from some people. Well, you know, it's the same lyrics over and over and over and over and over. Well, yeah, revival. Not, <laughs> yes, right, revival. Yeah, twelve times. Imagine that. But but it also tells a story from the preacher preaching when the well is dry. I mean, that's a story about doubt. You know, and everybody has doubt. Pastors have doubt. You know. Yes. It's just part of our makeup. But this tells this whole story. And then the revival part of it that goes on and on, I think allows people to let the rest of it sink in. You're not thinking about the music. You're singing along because it's the same, you know, it's the same melody and the same words for 12 times. But it gives people that breathing room to stop and say, yeah, okay, this is this whole thing makes sense in my life. All these words make sense to me. Yeah, I'm going to just read a couple of words. I still have my choir ring binder. It's traveled across the ocean twice, and I did have to call a few, some of my music, but this one stayed in. It says, every dreamer dreaming in their dead end job, every driver driving through the rush hour mob. Really? And I, I remembered the train in the chorus. I didn't remember all the words to the chorus, but it says, I can feel the brooding of your spirit, lay your burdens down lay your burdens down. Right. And to me, that's, those lyrics are precious. They are. And, and for me, that would fit in any service. Mm-hmm. Take, take, take your burdens to God. Yes. You know, and that's why God is there. Perfect. And I know that there's hymns that talk about real life problems, even if you know the story behind, say, it is well with my soul, the devastation experienced in the family of the person who wrote those lyrics, but not everybody knows that. So then you just hear the, it is well with my soul part. And this particular song also says to the widow walking through the veil of tears, and then kind of goes back to the chorus, lay your burden down. So it's not promising a quick fix, but just inviting um, to me, that's those, those words, lay your burdens down. That's kind of like an instruction. And I'm like, no, 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 I'll just hold on to my burdens. I can fix this. Of course I can't. (laughs) Right. Right. Really, who am I kidding? I could try, but as well with my soul, I think is my most. Not only is it my my one of my more favorite hymns, but I wrote music for my son's wedding. Yeah, I wrote it and then recorded it so that they could play it. And Mm -hmm. gotta have a little piece of me. So the introduction has a little tiny bit of a lick from "It Is Well with My Soul," and then at the end, nice um, for something of me to put in there because that that, that's just a that's a beautiful hymn. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Another of my favorites is Days of Elijah. So if you've never heard that one before, and I'd encourage you to look that one up too. I do have two final questions. Do you have any thoughts on whose voice might be missing from this conversation 
and or is there an elephant in the room when we're talking about contemporary church music in all its diversity? Well, I think the elephant in the room is uh, uh, some people feel as though the contemporary service isn't Lutheran enough, it isn't Episcopalian enough, it isn't Catholic enough, whatever, whatever it is. And that comes through pretty loud and clear. But for me, this is, for me, this, this brings people in to hear the word of God, whether you're Lutheran, Episcopalian, Catholic, if you're coming in to hear the word of God, then, and the, the music is sec, is secondary. So you could, if, if, if you're bringing people in because it's a contemporary service, that's really what's important. So they can hear the message and they can mm-hmm. feel God's love and feel the love of the congregation. Mm-hmm. And, and many parts of the liturgy are actually quite similar and they're not the same. I understand that, but the, say the confession and forgiveness and the Bible readings and things like yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. We have these morning meditations now through this whole pandemic and each pastor in town is ecumenical. They choose it. And it's surprising how, oh, right. We just talked about that too on Sunday. It's surprising mm-hmm. how the, the, the variant father is, they're working on the same themes every week as we are or the Episcopalians, the Congregationals, you know, Lutherans. And part of it, I think is, I like, I really like to be on time, Joanne. I was brought up to focus on time in most of my church services lasted an hour. And, you know, every once in a while, it was an hour and five minutes. And I kind of have a little bit of a sarcastic tone of voice, but I've learned since moving away, just living overseas with the military chapels, some of the services are approaching two hours, but you're so swept up in what's happening that you don't need, I mean, you kind of know it's two hours, but you're not looking at your watch. There's some really powerful music, powerful preaching. And around here, a lot of church services are actually less than an hour. And I'm thinking, wait a minute, sit down. We're not done yet. (laughs) So I think part of the question when you say, is it Lutheran enough, is that there's expectations about we have this strong experience of, okay, first we do this, then we do this, then we do this, and we collect the offering, and we say the Lord's Prayer, and we have communion. And I became less rigid in my expectations. I don't mind a little bit longer now, but I don't know if that kind of comes into play with with some folks too. Yeah, true. I think some, some, some people, and I'm comfortable with, I was, I'm comfortable with the short service, um, a little bit longer service, but I think you're right. People have expectations. Okay. I've got things to do. (laughs) We're going to keep it to an hour. I got to get out of here. (laughs) And then that makes a difference when you're looking at, okay, are we going to do every single thing in the hymnal that says, this is how we do a Lutheran service or any other denomination for that matter. So that's, is there room for, you know, if you're reading prayers, then, you know, even though I'm sure nobody times them, but you know how long it's going to take. If someone's praying extemporaneously, then I'm fine. If it takes longer, I don't have any problem with that, but we want to Mm -hmm. honor both tradition as well as innovation. And I I suppose that's a fine dance. Yeah, I think you're probably right. Yeah. Any other thoughts on this topic for us today, Joanne? I think this is an interesting thing to look at the different ways that people worship. And that neither one is right or wrong. They're just different. And people worship in different ways. And God speaks to them in different ways. God speaks to people without people being in church or ever having set foot in a church. Yes. And Um, sometimes it's in words and sometimes there's no words there either. Right. Do you feel like doing another 20 or 30 seconds of music to ease us back into the real world? Sure. Thank you very much. You are welcome. Thank you. You are my hiding place. You will protect me from trouble and surround me with songs of deliverance. Psalm 32, 7. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for your desire to speak to each and every one of us intimately, guiding us with your love, words, feelings, and grace. You find ways to touch our mind, souls, and bodies in spiritual ways. You touch us through nature with the songs of the wind brushing through the trees, the music of the birds' sweet melodies. You embrace our hearts with the silent tunes of the earth beneath us, with the dancing waves and ripples in the water. We hear you and feel you through the voices of song and powers in instruments. You take the impossible ways and make them possible to hear and embrace you. You make your supernatural presence known, even in the most subtle ways. You teach us and lead us to seek you and listen in unique scenarios. 
Thank you for always seeking us and finding us when we call out your name. We thank you for the ways you connect with us, embrace our beings, and gain our attention. May we always seek you out and hear you in the ways you make yourself known. Help us to be more open and confident in your voices. We praise you holy and intimately now, always, and forevermore. Amen.